Hello, I'm Dr Dawn Harper, I'm an NHS GP here in the Cotswolds and Ambassador for the Barn Theatre in Sirencester. So welcome to my first live clinic from behind the barn door where I hope to answer as many questions as I can that you may have either related to the coronavirus or actually anything else to do with your health. Uh, so I thought I'd kick off today with some myths that have been circulating. I have received various emails from friends and family over recent weeks and they are one of a theme basically these are emails that have either come into your inbox or they're posted on Facebook and they usually claim to come from a medical relative of a friend of a friend and that kind of gives some credence and and these requests have come into my inbox so many times over the last few weeks saying Dawn is this true that I thought we should try and address some of those myths because they are potentially quite dangerous in that it could lead people to doing things that they think mean are protecting themselves and those around them from coronavirus, whereas in fact they are still at risk. So let's start with the first one. Um, and the first myth is that if you can hold your breath for 10 seconds, then you don't have coronavirus. I'm afraid that isn't true. That is false. Uh, we know increasingly that some people have coronavirus with absolutely no symptoms whatsoever. So of course those people could easily be holding their breath and be and purportedly be fine but actually be transmitting the virus. I think like all old wives tales there's usually a, a semblance of truth or a, a little part of truth somewhere in the background and this probably comes uh, this particular myth from a test that doctors used to use uh, to assess people remotely over a telephone and it was called the Roth test um, and what we did was we got people to count from 0 to 30 in their native tongue as fast as they could and then timed how long it was before they needed to take a breath and if somebody needed to take a breath in less than eight seconds it was thought that that could reflect a poor oxygen supply in the blood um, and so that's probably where this myth came from but I'm afraid it doesn't matter how long you can hold your breath for you could still have coronavirus. Uh, the second is related to temperature um, there is a myth going around that the virus is killed at temperatures over 27 degrees um, and therefore if you drink plenty of hot drinks you won't get the virus. Again this isn't true. Most viruses that cause uh, lung problems, breathing difficulties, tend to be more common in the winter uh, and they die off in the summer but that's got less to do with the actual temperature and more probably to do with the fact that we're more likely to be out and about um, and not enclosed in small places with each other. We do know that this virus actually doesn't survive terribly well outside, um, but drinking hot drinks will not protect you. Uh, the virus thrives in humans in their lungs um, and that's significantly greater than 27 degrees. So I'm afraid drinking hot drinks, great to keep you hydrated, but it won't protect you from getting the virus. Um, and another one related to drinking, if you drink water every 15 minutes, then the theory is that that will flush the virus down into your stomach where it is killed by stomach acid. And again, I'm afraid this probably has some grains of truth in that you need to be well hydrated to remain well. And if you have a fever, you can actually 
become dehydrated quite quickly. You lose quite a lot of fluid, even with just one degree increased rise in temperature. But drinking water per se will not flush the virus away. Uh, the virus, the, the trachea separates into the, the trachea, sorry, the larynx separates into the trachea going into your lungs and the esophagus going down into your stomach quite high up and the virus can very happily travel down no matter how much you drink. Um, eating garlic will stop you from contracting the virus and again I can understand where this may have originated in that garlic is known to be good for our immune system. It contains a chemical called allium which is supposed to boost the immune system and actually it's, it's most effective when garlic is crushed uh, but that particular chemical is not robust in terms of temperature so when garlic is cooked then it becomes less active uh, and it won't protect you. Believe you me if the government could protect us from, um, from coronavirus by getting us all to eat raw garlic, we certainly wouldn't be investing the millions of, of, money, of pounds that we are in Nightingale hospitals and protective equipment and the like. So garlic is great for the immune system generally, but it's not going to protect you from getting the virus. Leaving post or parcels outside for 15 minutes will kill off the virus. And again, this isn't true. We are on a steep learning curve with uh, this virus, and we know that it can survive outside the human body for quite some time. We think it likes metal surfaces most, and could certainly, we think, last for about 72 hours, possibly longer. Cardboard and paper, we think less, uh, maybe 24 hours or so. Uh, but what we do in my house is we take any parcels in, um, we remove all the outside packaging, either on newspaper and then bundle it all up, or if we open it on the side, we wipe down the sides afterwards and dispose of all the packaging, wash our hands, and then inspect the contents. Um, you can make effective home san hand sanitizers from vodka. You can't. <laughs> um, vodka is about 40% proof alcohol, and the hand sanitizer gel, which is alcohol based, must be over 60%, usually 75% plus, up to 95% alcohol. So you simply won't have a strong enough alcohol content if you're trying to make hand sanitizer from your vodka. I'm sure you can put it to better use. Um, and the final myth is drinking silver will prevent you from contracting the coronavirus. Now, silver is known to have some antimicrobial properties, um, and we use it in some dressings. But drinking silver, and you can buy colloidal silver to drink, but it is damaging to your kidneys, it can cause fits, and it can turn your skin blue. So please don't go down that route. So those are the myths that are circulating, and I hope that I've been able to explain why those don't work um, and why it's important that you don't rely on them because, of course, you might be thinking that you're protecting yourself and your loved ones and you're not. Um, and I thought I'd also, you can imagine my phone's been ringing off the hook, my inbox is absolutely log jammed and, and there are a few uh, questions that keep coming in um, and I thought perhaps before I go to some of your questions I'd just like to deal with three of the most common questions that I've been asked in recent weeks. Uh, the first is about repeat prescriptions. A lot of people saying that you know most surgeries will only give a month of a drug at any one time and a lot of patients asking if they could ask for uh, more of, of their drugs, so maybe a two-month supply or get their repeat prescription a little bit early in order to make sure that they've got it in stock. Now, I understand the concern. I, I know why that might feel like the right thing to do, but we are constantly reassured that our supply chains actually for our medicines are very robust, and there is no suggestion that we're going to run out of medicines. But if everybody suddenly asks for twice as much or asks for their prescription two weeks early, then you can see that there would be a huge spike in demand, and that way we could potentially run into trouble uh, and may not be able to get all the medicines to all the people that need. So please, I would ask you, only ask for what you need. Uh, please understand that we are still only issuing monthly scripts for most things. Um, if you want to reduce the contact with your surgery, and I completely understand that, most surgeries now have electronic prescribing, so you can nominate your pharmacy, and therefore you don't need to go into your surgery to collect a paper script. You can actually just go in and your pharmacist will have that ready for you. 
Uh, another common one that I'm being asked a lot is whether it is still safe for children to have their childhood immunisations uh, whilst this is going on. And I would say to you, please, um, whilst the coronavirus is wreaking havoc in our communities, uh, other things still go on um, and the nasty diseases that our childhood vaccination program protects against are still out there. You may well find in my surgery, for example, we have a gazebo up in our car park and we are doing whatever we possibly can outside to reduce the footfall in the surgery. So if you have an appointment to take your child for an immunisation, please do that, um, provided you are all well. Obviously, if you're self-isolating because somebody in the family is unwell, then please let your surgery know and they will rearrange the appointment for you. And the third one that I am being asked a lot is about outpatient appointments. Now, here in Gloucestershire, most routine outpatient appointments now are being postponed. So what I would say to you is if you have uh, an appointment coming up, if it's, for example, at the tail end of this week, then on the top of your letter, there will be a telephone number which will take you through to that clinic. Please phone and check whether the clinic is still going. Urgent appointments obviously still will happen, but a lot of routine appointments will be uh, postponed or cancelled so please just check rather than just turning up at the hospital and if your appointment is not for another two or three weeks please wait until nearer the time because this is such a rapidly evolving situation that I don't think any of us really know where we're going to be two weeks from now. So that's all from me. We've got a couple of um, questions that have already come in, so thank you for that. Um, Catherine uh, is asking, after a big shop, what is the recommendation with regards to food? Do packages need cleaning or leaving in quarantine for 72 hours? Well, Catherine, I think the sensible thing here is obviously we're trying to reduce the amount that people are shopping, so going as infrequently as you can. Um, what I would suggest you do is bring... Uh, everything in in one go. Remove all outside packaging that you can and discard of that straight away. Similar to post, I guess, you know, then wipe your, sur your surfaces down and wash your hands. Um, if you can leave things for 72 hours without touching them, maybe you've got a garage space that you can do that, then you are guaranteed that nobody else has touched that product for 72 hours. But I think certainly if you can remove outside packaging, that's a good thing to do. And I've got a question here from somebody, an anonymous patient. I have suffered high blood pressure for years, but always declined medications favouring reduction through weight, through weight loss or exercise with mixed success. I've read that those with high blood pressure are at risk. Should I contact my GP and start any medication? Okay, well, there's a few points to this one. Um, high blood pressure alone is not a risk factor, but a lot of people... Uh, who have high blood pressure might also have, for example, heart disease or diabetes, and that would put them at risk. As a general rule of thumb, if you are an adult and you are invited for a flu vaccine each year, then I think you should consider yourself to be in an at-risk group and take precautions accordingly. High blood pressure alone is not an indication for a flu vaccine, but if... Um, whoever you are, if you are offered a flu vaccine, then you probably should be considering yourself at risk. In terms of contacting your GP, I'm sure you will understand that we are utterly inundated at the moment. Uh, and if you can afford it, I would be more inclined to invest in a home blood pressure monitor and take some readings at home. Uh, good luck with your weight loss. You're completely right. Blood pressure uh, between, so we like your blood pressure to be lower than 140 over 90. If it is consistently 160 over 100 or more, then we would be quite insistent on getting you to start medications. If you're between, so 140 to 160 over 90 to 100, if you're between those two readings, then lifestyle measures is a very sensible thing to do. So trying to lose weight, stopping smoking, reducing your salt intake, uh, cutting down the fat in your diet and increasing the amount of exercise you do are all really great things to try and get your blood pressure under control. So I think what I would say to you is that if you could invest in your home monitor and if your re readings are good, then that's great. Keep doing what you're doing. If they're in that middle area, then really give yourself a good talking to about trying to lose weight, using this lockdown as a, as a time to kind of really 
you get yourself back on track. Uh, but if your readings are consistently over 160, over 100, then please, yes, do contact your GP. Um, and it may be exactly this kind of thing that you might be seeing a nurse out in the car park to get your blood pressure checked, but it may be that you need to reconsider and start some medication. So thank you for those questions. We've got, goodness me, <laughs> we've got a lot of comments here. So let me start uh, right at the top. Here we go. Do you have any recommendations for supplements, medicine or indeed dietary options that while no replacement for the current guidelines are a good idea at this time? Uh, so I think what we're saying here is, is what sort of supplements should people be taking? And I'm going to tell you what we take in my house and what I've got my mum and dad on. And that is uh, vitamin C with zinc. Uh, we have them, I think mum and dad have got them as, as chewable uh, supplements. We have them as little tablets that you dissolve in water, which we take every morning. Uh, there is some evidence that vitamin C and zinc are good for boosting the immune system. So if that's something you can get hold of, I certainly would consider adding that to your daily routine. Um, what risks are you seeing being taken most often by the public that aren't assumed to be dangerous, as dangerous as they are? And I guess what you're referring to is the issues with social distancing. Um, do you know, I think we're pretty good here in Gloucestershire. Um, when I come in here to do this clinic, we're definitely practicing social distancing. The roads, I'm pleased to say, are really very empty. Um, I've seen uh, police out on horseback and, and I've heard about uh, some road checks where people are just, uh, police are just asking where people are going. And I think most of us are really trying to do the right thing. Uh, but I would just, you know, an extra plea really to say, please do stay indoors um, whenever you can. If nothing else, I think the more people we see out and about, the more there is a subliminal message that that's okay. Um, I'm sure you've all seen the video links from exhausted staff on the front line. I have some friends in anaesthetics at Gloucester Royal, um, in A&E in Bristol, and they are very intelligent, level-headed. Um, you know, they're not panickers by any stretch of the imagination, but they are frightened. So I think we can all do our bit um, and to really cut social contact down as much as we possibly can. Do homemade masks make any difference at all? Surely they are better than nothing. Okay, uh, they won't stop the virus. Okay, this virus is minute. It's a tiny particle that can pass between the, uh, the fibres of any fabric that you might want to make a mask at home. But they do actually have a role. And where they may help is they they will stop you touching your face. It is surprising how much we touch our faces without even really thinking about it. Um, and so just wearing a mask might well reduce the amount of, of tactile, the amount that you touch your face. So from that point of view, they may help. Um, mental health is likely to become a big, bigger public issue during this time of isolation. Do you have any advice in this situation that is out of the ordinary? Do you expect a larger public mental health problem to arise? Do you know, I wish I could say no, but I think it's inevitable. Um, already, I think there is a heightened anxiety out there. So people who've not been anxious or had health anxieties in the past are contacting us now, uh, very frightened, very worried. And of course, those with existing uh, mental health issues are finding that anxiety is escalating. Isolation is, you know, really not good for our mental health. So we are seeing people uh, getting quite depressed. Uh, and I think it's important for all of us that we find ways of supporting those people who might be more vulnerable to mental health problems. So please embrace technology. I'm a little bit of a Luddite when it comes to technology, but I FaceTime my mum and dad every day and my brother down in Cornwall. Um, we're probably actually in contact more now than we were when we had the freedom to pass between each other's houses. Um, but I think it's really important. So um, I would advise everybody just, you know, maybe take this time to go through your address book 
um, pick the phone up to people that perhaps you've only communicated by text or Christmas cards for the last few years. This is an opportunity to touch base with them again. Uh, try and structure your day. If it's you that's struggling, try and structure your day. So um, maybe it's um, a language that you've kind of lost. Maybe you could uh, use Babel or Duolingo and, and get online and, and teach yourself that language again or a new language um, maybe you could embrace something new you can use some online delivery to perhaps get some art supplies and start painting um, perhaps use one of the online activities um, exercise classes dance classes there's so much going on now um, people really are thinking outside the box so try to keep yourself uh, busy um, and in touch with the rest of the world but yeah it is going to be a huge problem and if you are one of those people who is really struggling please you know we do still want to hear from you I know we're spending a lot of time in general practice saying that we're discouraging people from coming to the surgery but we are still triaging patients and we are still very much talking to patients with coronavirus symptoms, symptoms and those without you know you are we are still here for you um, as are the mental health charities mind and the Samaritans you know there are people out there to talk to so please if you're struggling make contact with somebody and do it today um, do you see any health issues arising from extended time spent out of the sun lack of vitamin D um, actually we are getting into that time of year where hopefully the weather well it is isn't it it's improving and you really only need 15 minutes of sun exposure to get an adequate amount of vitamin D uh, so I would you know I hope that we are all taking advantage of the government guidelines that we can if we are not self-isolating we and we're not one of the very vulnerable people that we can still go out once a day for a form of exercise walking cycling um, running uh, and if you're doing that as long as you've got your arms exposed your face out then actually you will get enough vitamin D so I don't see that as a problem other than for those people who really have got to stay indoors and we mean absolutely indoors in which case you may well want to consider taking some vitamin D supplements. Um, are doctors still doing contraception implants and smear testing? Um, I think you will probably find um, a week ago, we perhaps were, but it's worth contacting your surgery uh, by telephone or email just to ask what their facilities are for this. Um, you may find that some family planning clinics are still um, opening but this is a very rapidly changing uh, vista just today we've heard about routine outpatient appointments at hospitals being cancelled or postponed so check with your providers to what they are doing to reassure you in terms of smears um, the smear test is not looking for cancer it's looking for changes in cells in the cervix which if left untreated for years could potentially become cancerous so if you have to have your smear delayed by a few weeks or months that will not have an impact in terms of your safety long term important that you go when you can uh, when, when we recall you um, but that kind of time frame of a delay will not be a problem for you right and how is the NHS working to reduce risk within its own healthcare staff um, do you know, we're all very aware that uh, we are living in extraordinary times. Um, I think we are trying very hard to uh, be there for each other. I know that um, I think the Five Valleys Counselling Service in Stroud are offering free sessions to healthcare workers um, who are struggling, who might need some counselling. Uh, we very much, in my team, we have our own little mini COBRA meeting at the beginning of each day where we just check in on how everybody's coping um, and also make sure that we all know uh, what the protocols are for that day and how we're going to manage demands and so on. Um, we are in, undoubtedly, we are going to see a lot more stress related illness in the health system um, and across the board I'm sure um, you know the financial pressures that are being felt by people from all walks of life I think now are, are very real uh, so 
We've all got to be there for each other. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we're doing this clinic here. Um, I know that sometimes it can be difficult to get through to your GP surgery. You know, demand is massive at the moment. So uh, we're going to be here every week on Mondays at three o'clock. My email uh, here is drdawn at barntheatre.org.uk. It'll be open all week. Um, and I will be back here um, at three o'clock next Monday to answer as many questions as you've got. So please bring them down um, to me. Um, log on and listen to us next week. Um, I will try and update my blog on my website, which is www.drdawn.com. Um, and I will be answering as many questions as I can here next week. But until then, until Monday, three o'clock next week, stay safe.